All right, well, uh, thanks everyone for being patient and for uh, attending this presentation by Lakshmi Maya. Uh, my name is Baman Shirazi, I'm the chair of this committee and I've been working with uh, Lakshmi uh, for quite a few years now since uh, I, you know, I was back in California and uh, uh, I'm really happy to see Lakshmi get to this stage and uh, I've been working with her all along with uh, different aspects of this work, which is not Open. exactly... Oh, okay, good, good. Um, hello, Please Professor Ron. Oh, Jason. Hi, Brahman. Yes, Brahman. Shuraji, Professor Sab. Well, good morning, well, good evening. Thanks for yes. having me. Yes, thanks for joining us. We're all over the place, so we have all kinds of climate and times of day here. Um, I was just introducing myself, and so I'll go quickly to introducing you. Uh, I just wanted to say hello to you because this is the first time I'm, I'm meeting you and thank you very much for being part of this committee and being available for this meeting. Um, professor uh, Jaisim, Krishna Rao Jaisim is an architect and, and a professor and uh, he's the founder of Jaisim Fountainhead, a well-known architectural firm in India which was founded in 1970 and uh, uh, has a wide reputation for doing all kinds of important work. I don't know too much about your background, so please supplement uh, my little introduction with anything you would like to add to it. I know that uh, your work is, uh, uh, you know, especially uh, with uh, many institutions and universities in India. So I think that having you on this committee has, has been very important. Uh, I'm not much of a, uh, uh, I don't have much of a background in architecture, but uh, um, I rely on any comments you might have today and uh, all your support. Um, Professor uh, Jaisim has, uh, has authored many, many articles and, and journals. Probably, I, I read somewhere more than 200. So uh, you seem to have a long career in architecture. You've done many presentations and you've won numerous awards, uh, pages of it. Uh, so I don't even know if I can list any of, of, of them here. Uh, you have been with many important uh, institutions in India, the Council of Architecture, the Indian Institute of Ar Ar Architects and Practicing Architects Association, as well as the Energy Research Institute, I believe more than that also. So uh, your company or, or institution, Jason Fountainhead has, um, you know, has a philosophy which is, which is unique in, uh, how it uh, brings together uh, the client and the orientation that you have, which I read somewhere uh, as being iconoclastic, individualistic, and eco-friendly. <laughs> I don't know if these descriptions are ever fair to anyone, but uh, I read up a little bit about your background and uh, I hope I've done justice uh, to uh, this short introduction. So please, if you like to say anything at the moment, I'll just, uh, you know, wait for you to... Just a small point, Professor Berman. It's sheer honor to be with you all and share from this little country up here on this great morning and probably your great evening and share the thoughts of this insult architecture with you all and then to meet your people online. It's a great Thank pleasure you. for me from this point. I'm honored. Thank you very much. Same, same here. And our... Uh, other committee member is Dr. Devashish Banerjee, who most of you know. Uh, Devashish is the Haridas Chaudhary Professor of Indian Philosophies and, and Cultures at CIIS. This is a position that has been occupied only by a, a handful of people, uh, Dr. Rina Sarkar and uh, uh, a couple of other people in the whole history of the Institute. And uh, Devashish has been holding that position for the past five or six years. Is also the um, director of the East-West Psychology Program. I think most of you know Debashish, but for those of you who don't, uh, Debashish has a long history in um, um, culture and arts of India, philosophies and spiritual traditions. Uh, 
Um, I consider him an expert on Sri Aurobindo and on Indian art. And I believe he has some knowledge of Indian architecture as well. I know that when we went to Orville together a few years back, um, we um, engaged in a lot of uh, um, conversations there about the architecture of Orville. And uh, he also arranged for us to go down to a curriculum in South India where uh, the um, traditional uh, training of architects and uh, yoga are combined. And I had a great experience actually myself there. So uh, probably Lakshmi has a little more to say about that um, today as well. So um, uh, I will make this short because we're running late. So uh, Lakshmi, I think what we're gonna be doing is to give you the time that uh, we discussed earlier, maybe around mm -hmm. 40 minutes or so. And I will uh, flag you about then, you know, Kingle a couple minutes over or whatever, but uh, but I'm sure you're prepared for that. Mm -hmm. And then the committee will have some questions and comments and we'll have that conversation for some time. I, I don't know how long that will take exactly, but we have two hours for the whole meeting. And then yeah. what the committee will do at the end of that part of the meeting is go into a um, separate session Zoom session to discuss the outcome of uh, your presentation and our decision. And then we'll rejoin you back. During that time, you can engage the audience, you know, any questions and comments. And then we'll join you back for that conversation. And, uh, and then we'll finish within or maybe less than two hours. Um, so without further ado, uh, please go ahead. I Thank have, you, uh, Ramu. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Bauman. And um, it feels like such a big gift to be present with uh, the three of you here, the, um, the Debashish, um, Jasmine, and you. Um, it's been so lovely to work with you guys. I look up to you a lot. And I see a lot of the CIS community here and uh, my family and our friends, I thank you. Um, I think with that, that I'll um, directly go to the topic. Um, the purpose of the study has been to um, shift the dominant discourse in architecture through a consideration of whole person psychology and evolutionary consciousness perspectives. Um, human beings have forever been concerned with the ways in which they mediate the contents of consciousness as within, so without. We've been told by um, thinkers, philosophers, and wise men throughout the ages and from uh, various cultures that what is within becomes without, and in turn, what is without becomes within, that we are the architects of our own experience. Winston uh, Churchill once famously said, we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. Our thoughts shape our spaces and our spaces return a favor. Stephen Johnson. The basic premise presented in this theoretical research is that architecture is an expression of the evolution of human instincts and externalization of a cultural collective psyche in built form. It is an instinct that becomes more and more conscious in the course of evolution of consciousness. And I uh, propose that the very understanding of this architectural evolution itself is changing. Now, um, architect Rossi the, says the architectural form allows the architect to approach a city's problems by understanding the existing built space as the concrete data summarizing real experiences. Now, architecture that reflects human behavior will necessarily be shaped by it. And uh, if architecture is capable of communicating the ideas, beliefs, and values of a culture or of human condition, then what does that language look like in built form in the present day urban scenario? As a trained and licensed architect and having worked for around 12 plus years, I think about this a lot as I'm interested in understanding the positioning of consciousness within the context of what urban architecture is actually becoming. Seven years ago, I um, decided to take a step back from my architectural practice and uh, I was drawn to go back to school, CIS, to study depth psychology, 
consciousness studies, mythology, um, ancient practices of self, mind, and nature as a way to approach architecture from a different lens and reignite my fascination for built structures. I wanted to get um, additional education that would allow me to experience and gain understanding of the connection of inner depth inquiry to outer built spaces firsthand, um, rather than relying on other people's impressions. The presumption um, in my initial studies was to rethink the role of the architect and to fully understand the ontological potential of space so as to incorporate such considerations into the design process. The key research findings and theories about consciousness evolution suggest that in our moment of history, there's a radical transformation in consciousness as believed by many thinkers from uh, different disciplines of philosophy, psychology, cultural studies, anthropology, spirituality, um, wisdom traditions across the planet. Now, both Sri Aurobindo and Gebser have um, made significant contributions to the field of consciousness studies. Their theories suggest that we are at the threshold of an evolutionary shift marked by a significant leap from a predominantly mind-centered consciousness or the age of reason towards an all-emerging, all-inclusive, whole-person, soul-centered consciousness. Now, soul referring to a vaster, deeper expression of individual consciousness. Sri Aurobindo and Gebser both described a model of consciousness that moves from a state of non-differentiated unity towards conscious integration. This movement can be perceived as an ongoing development within society with a collective awareness that is participatory, action that is contextualized within uh, the needs of the others and the whole. And invites individuals and groups to creatively engage in the process of human evolution. I believe that one crucial way to mediate our deeper expression of individual and collective consciousness is through harnessing the power of built environments, the power of architecture. If you want to shape minds, shape spaces in which those minds dwell. But architecture, as it is generally practiced, critics contend, assumes autonomy in conflict with the concerns of the collective, with architects self-identifying with their efforts in a very one-sided uh, process of hyper-rationalism or egocentricism. Now, how do we educate architects to move beyond this individualistic approach toward awakening um, and integral architectural consciousness and praxis. And I have attempted an agenda of such evolutionary involvement that is a contribution towards conscious evolution um, within the field of architecture and our understanding of built spaces reflection of an influence on human psyche. To do so along with the evolutionary and historical perspective already described, the study has turned to psychology specifically whole person psychology as a fifth wave or school and as developed by thinkers such as um, Sri Aurobindo, Jung, uh, Roberto Asagioli um, that can offer a lens by which architects and architecture theorists, um, designers, urban planners among others can better understand their design impulses and tailor their work to more closely align with a post-mental sense of soul, that is a next evolutionary and integral stage in architecture. Um, whole person psychology, as uh, Professor Bauman Shirazi says, um, or describes the totality, it considers the totality of the human phenomenon, such as such an approach seeks to involve all human dimensions, for example, the body, the vital, the rational and the humanistic realms. Psychically, it engages the everyday rational, the unconscious depths and the higher impulses of what humans have always considered sacred. Um, Sri Aurobindo's integral yoga psychology, Jungian psychology and Asagioli's psychosynthesis all focus on the same central themes of um, health and healing, psychological and spiritual growth and transformation, um, integration and wholeness, 
furthermore, this whole person perspective includes not just the transformation of the individual, but also the transformation of creative disciplines, society, cultures, and ecosystems. Each presents a whole that is comprised in part of other wholes. So my interest lies thus um, in the intersection of architecture, consciousness evolution studies, and psychology. And it is through my study of uh, Jungian psychology, consciousness studies, and whole person psychology at CIS that uh, I have found a multidimensional approach to the discipline of architecture. This dialectical connection between the fields allows consideration of not only how debates from transpersonal psychology, integral yoga and psychology, cultural theory, philosophy, whole person themes, and so on, um, might begin to inform a discussion about architecture, but also how architecture and the built environment might offer a potentially rich field for analysis for integral studies and other disciplines. The central objective has been to make known the aspects of evolutionary consciousness and whole person psychology and to explore their connections to an impact on architectural learning and practices. In order to meet this goal, the project needed to describe uh, the development of evolution of consciousness um, as it is understood over the arc of history and to examine the emergence of whole person psychology as a fifth wave within the field of psychology that correlates to the later stages of consciousness evolution. It then could apply these understandings to the field of architecture and demonstrate how this relationship has already existed, unfolded as an evolutionary process and um, carried through time, even if not properly understood. Um, this correlation would then set the framework for considering the integral and holistic movement present in whole person psychology as it applies to architecture today, including both architectural fundamental purpose and the role and approach of the architect in executing that purpose. Taken as a whole, the sketching of a new evolutionary movement in architecture would become available. It would become possible to envision this new architecture in the transdisciplinary cross hairs of this diagram we have uh, before us. Um, whole person psychology, evolution, evolutionary consciousness studies, and the field of architecture, all taking place within the role of the individual architect and the architectural field. There are two unique steps I took in pursuing this line of inquiry. In the first, Gebser's five stages of evolutionary consciousness were mapped onto and correlated with the periods and developments in architectural history, forming an original contributions to this area of dialogue. Um, secondly, Asagioli's three aspects of the unconscious, which lie at the core of his, uh, of his psychological uh, framework, were mapped onto expressive modes of architecture that correspond to these levels of being, thereby illustrating the place in consciousness architects typically operate from in addressing different types of design and structures. Gebser's uh, structures of consciousness, the archaic, magic, mythic, uh, mental, and integral describe the evolution of consciousness over time. These were shown to correlate with distinct periods of architectural history, revealing the way that architecture has evolved over macro periods, macro time periods, while mirroring collective psychological development, including degrees of consciousness and the ways of perceiving the world. This correlation thus offers an opportunity to look at the history of architecture by the way of understanding the evolution of consciousness and to explore ways this understanding can inform how the architecture, how history of architecture is taught. The first of the stages, the archaic, is uh, the primeval with no sense of dimensionality, no sense of space and time, and full of unfolded potential. In this state, no distinction is made between the human being and the environment. And this coincides with the pre-architectural time where dwellings were temporary and the basic survival and action was guided largely by instinct. The magic structure which uh, follows the archaic develops a sense of self and tribe, space and time, agricultural relationship with place, 
and attributes powers to the sacred, magical, ritual, and the symbolic. Here, architectural structures emerge from practical uses, such as dwellings and granaries. Additionally, we um, see the first Neolithic efforts to satisfy humans' emotional and spiritual needs via symbolism, ritual, and magic. This results in the first early temples, tombs, rock formations, and other religious structures. Um, the transition between what Gebser calls magic and mythic consciousness marks the emergence of a sense of polarity, symmetry, orientations to the earth through agriculture, and gradual growth of large farming settlements or proto-cities. Architecturally, monumental style dominated and served to be functional as well as symbolic. Abstraction and organic symbolism blended with massiveness and refinement of structure. The Egyptian temples and pyramids are good examples of this transition period uh, where the cult of the dead and the gods were given the most importance. The mythic consciousness, the third of Gebser's structures, is um, characterized by storytelling. Interpreting life through myths as a type of dreaming became a way to enter into a relationship with reality. This new orientation around um, story required imagination as a means, to, means of interpretation and provided new inspiration for artists, builders, architects um, in the mythic structure, architecture moved towards the concepts of order and law of proportions, where harmonics, the golden ratio, rhythm, symmetry, and the relationship of individual parts to the whole became characteristics of classical architecture. This lengthy classical period witnessed uh, the transition from increasingly settled and complex architectural um, agricultural villages uh, to what are regarded as the uh, world's first cities. Um, and today we see its remnants across antiquity from the columns of um, ancient Greece uh, and Rome to the highly refined and detailed aesthetic codes in India, China, and Japan. So the mental structure of uh, Gebser's uh, fourth overlaps for long periods with preceding mythic structure and marks the true awakening of the independent ego. Initiated in religious hero stories of 800 to 500 BCE and uh, developing exponentially over time, this heightened sense of individuality gives rise to the realization of humans as being separate from nature. The mental increasingly emphasizes an analytical orientation, perspective, rational reasoning, which can be attributed to a sense of wakefulness, unlike um, the dream specific magic and the mythical structures. This coincides with uh, vision, depth, and an analysis of physical space. Later period, um, Classical architecture increasingly reflects the transition process from the mythic to the mental, uh, beginning in the European Renaissance and Industrial Revolution and fully blossoming in the 20th century movements in architecture. We see this structure in modern architectural schools of um, rationalism, functionalism, contextualism, deconstructivism. These approaches increasingly emphasize science, economics, and a huge sense of individuality. Aesthetics trend against ornamentation and suffocating uh, traditions and focus insta instead on creative energies and critical thinking. Now, the transition from the fourth to the fifth structure in Gebser's theory is that of the mental to the still emerging integral structure. The integral structure, as discussed previously, presents, represents the conscious participatory engagement of the self in service to the reintegration of the whole. This four-dimensional trans, uh, transparent reality transcends all dualities and moves forward without the self-limiting aspects of the perspectival mental structure. In doing so, it represents the ongoing movement within society 
of a non-differentiated unity moving toward conscious self-realization and integration. While this integral transition has already been in process for some time, it remains at present in a process of becoming. Similarly, through um, elements of this transition can be seen in organic and um, environmentally conscious architecture, which I've, which I've um, seen in exponential, which I've seen an exponential growth in the last 20 years. Um, it remains that there is yet to be developed integral or ensoul period architecture on the horizon. What might such an integral uh, architecture, architectural period look like? And how might it be created? What awareness, tools, and frameworks are necessary for such an emergence to take place? To answer these questions, a Sargioli's psychosynthesis model and architecture were placed in dialogue. As an original transdisciplinary contribution, this framework allowed for a diverse range of perspectives and built structures in architecture to be grouped according to these three intrapsychic dimensions of psychosynthesis, the middle unconscious, the low unconscious, and the high unconscious. The view diagram shows the three layers of the unconscious in Asagioli's framework. These three layers were correlated with the three core spatial concepts in architecture architecture for function, architecture for the unconscious, and architecture for the sacred. This was done to elucidate the state of consciousness with which architects commonly engage in designing such spaces and can be seen as a way of thought that uniquely contributes to the discussion of psychology of um, urban built spaces in the theory of architecture. The middle section of Sargioli's framework, the middle unconscious, is the most immediate layer which forms the foundation of our conscious expression in the world. It is directly engaged with our uh, daily ego functions and more than either of the other unconscious uh, categories exists in direct association with awareness. Now, within the architectural design process, the work of the middle unconscious is reflected in the number of in a number of um, functional aspects like uh, preliminary and schematic design, uh, conceptual planning and zoning, design development, construction documentation, and administration. In short, it is within the middle unconscious that the bulk of everyday architectural work takes place. The low unconscious houses the instincts inst instinctual and the primitive, and the many associated complexes, intense emotions and primordial fears that develop within a civilized environment that meters out and manages these urges. Postmodern or radical architecture with its emphasis on deconstructivism correlates to this realm and represents an effort to bring forward and reunite these disavowed elements. The architect identifies with and evokes a process of inner creativity in response to the, uh, to the lower realms and unconsciously releasing repressed aspects of self to incorporate into a new form of creativity. The top section of the, deck, of the egg diagram um, represents the high unconscious or the super, supraconscious, which is the realm glimpsed in creative inspiration, spiritual insight and peak experiences. Now, Asagioli viewed this area as a counterbalance to the pathological focus of his contemporaries, emphasizing height psychology as much as depth psychology. Um, and it's not very hard to make the natural correlation to various expression of sacred architecture that have taken place throughout history. Architects and builders in these contexts have explored how architecture and spirituality interact to construct um, sacred experience, inflow of superconscious energies animates and gives meaning to structure, which can be understood as a manifestation of the high unconscious in built form. Now, in mapping these correlations, we can see that the architect's creative imagination and its subsequent creative expression in built form differ according to the level of consciousness from which it originates. This also sheds light on architecture's current condition. 
without a coherent concept of this framework and a substantive notion of the whole and the interworkings of these levels, the result is fragmentation. Today, these design uh, impulses, different design impulses often seem to lay at odds. In most urban uh, built spaces, we are witnessing the intensification of fragmentary design approaches. Design practices that uh, do not correspond to a um, unique whole, unique vision of wholeness, but more to the demands of segmentation, specialization, thus spatially reflecting the fragmented state of the urban consciousness and collective psyche. The city thus exists in psychosis, characterized by its isolation, alienation, and emptiness. This dysphoric experience is characterized by visual, sensory, and informational overload, precisely the opposite of the experience of wholeness and well being. Through an awareness of whole person uh, paradigm proposed, such schisms can uh, begin to be healed. Asagioli believed that um, psychological development involves the exploration, integration of the three unconscious realms, the middle, the lower, and the higher. That is, if that the, we must recognize the horizontal value structure that Asagioli placed upon the three unconscious layers. The higher unconscious is not considered to be of greater value or more importance or more significance than the uh, middle or the low unconscious. Rather, each presents its particular content to be integrated, integrated into a functioning whole. Thus, the process of fragmentation towards wholeness is possible through integration of different aspects of the psyche and the agency or the agent of the integration is the soul or the self with a capital S. In the context of architecture, this suggests a means by which to move toward an integral experience of wholeness. It suggests that the height of aesthetic experience of built spaces can be a whole person architecture based on soul-centered and the imaginal perception. In engaging the reality of psychic life in its various aspects from this perspective, architecture begin to move, architecture can begin to move more fully um, into the next evolutionary state as an expression of Gebser's integral structure. One movement that uh, can be seen as being uh, transitional between the fourth mental structure and the integral fifth is organic architecture or biophilic architecture and the general movement toward green building and emphasis on um, low impact buildings and sustainability. While sometimes focused more exclusively on technical capabilities, such as greenhouse emissions and energy efficiency, these movements sometimes synthesize sustainability efforts with the vision of a contemplative space where art con convenes with nature. They place an em emphasis on the overall setting rather than a single element, thinking in terms of ecosystems and organisms. And they employ botanical shapes and forms such as curves and spears, um, local craftsmanship and traditional and natural materials. While at the moment, it is not possible to be exhaustive in analyzing their work. I share here a few professionals and luminaries who can be seen as contributing to this conversation. Ethel Wright believed in uh, designing in harmony with, human, with humanity and the environment, a philosophy he called organic architecture, designed over a thousand structures over 70 years. Um, Mies van der Rohe combining the functionalist industrial concerns with an aesthetic drive toward minimal intersecting planes. His words, less is more, God is in details. Louis Kahn, through symbolic geometries, he defined an authentic modern monumentality. Uh, Jeffrey Bauer, one of the uh, original proponents of tropical modernism, a design movement in which sensitivity, sensitivity for local context combines with the form making principles of modernism. Um, Roth Azulik architecture, Roth is responsible for creating spaces, all of which are very refreshing and imaginative, environmentally conscious and built to ensure they leave no carbon footprint. Um, Christopher Alexander based in Berkeley, as many of you here might know of him, um, is the author of A Pattern Language, a book 
that although mentioned periodically in architectural conversations, scholarship and student criticisms has not yet had an impact it should. Um, Dharmesh from Orville embraces the use of locally available materials, uh, furthers traditional crafts and creates opportunities for local artisans, all, all the while adapting uh, them to contemporary sensibilities and contexts. Other pioneering Indian architects or architectural firms include Dean de Cruz, Gerald de Kuna, and uh, Krishnal Jessim of Jessim Fountainhead. And we are very lucky to have him here with us. Um, so such efforts point toward an emerging style in architecture. However, while organic architecture exhibits a, a transitional quality, integral consciousness is, a, is more than mimicking nature or promoting sustainability. Uh, furthermore, sustainability cannot be achieved by attending only to such objective issues, such as a technology and ecology. Equally necessary is attention to the subjective, psycho-spiritual, psycho-cultural factors of human experience. Lastly, many of these expressions today exist within a relatively closed environment. Since integral architecture is both individual and collective, it will likely explore um, how such ex new expressions interact with and engage with the pre-existing built environment, as well as the preceding consciousness structures. As an uh, integral structure becomes more developed in the world, we will um, inevitably see these impulses and awareness um, expressed in architecture in the years and decades ahead. And what these unique holes will look like is hard to tell at this moment and remains an open question. At least uh, we are discussing these matters in academia and um, this was the main goals, one of the main goals of this study. Um, one concept that can be useful in considering this new paradigm is the idea of world soul, the notion that a building or a city can be seen as a living being. In this way, Built spaces can be recognized as having a soul beyond their outer facade. The ensouled body, rather than just individual, becomes the urban built space as a whole. The soul is an organizing principle within that goes beyond the mental. It can be referred to as that part of you that sees and observes. It is present. The present outer built environment is a reflection of the inner psychic realm of the soul. The evolutionary paradigm thus shifts from an exclusively focusing on individual psychic transformation to also include the restoration of the world soul. And the transformation, um, the physical world's, and to transform the uh, physical world's psychic reality. Builders and city planners can then consider how to raise the consciousness of uh, common spaces and built environments and thereby affect the soul consciousness and healthiness of the collective. This study proposes the concept of ensouled architecture as exactly that, a whole person soulful perspective in architecture, informed by whole person psychology and corresponding to the emergent integral structure in Gebser's evolution of consciousness. As a new paradigm for architecture and specifically the role of the architect, and sold architecture intends to help architects become holistically aware and requires of the architect new responsibilities, including um, self-development and inner depth inquiry. Through a greater awareness of the higher and the low unconscious, and by drawing this awareness into the middle unconscious for conscious expression, the creative output of architects can be expanded and better reflect the integral ideals ensconced in the collective. Such an approach is rooted in um, expanding the imaginations and the imaginal capacity of architects. This imaginal approach is uh, different than being imaginary, which is rational, which is mentally based and suggests pursuing um, that which is utopian, uh, overly idealistic and unreal. Rather, imaginal engagement means awakening to the uh, metaphorical and the symbolic language of the soul which mediates between the sensory objective reality and a post-mental inner realm. Mm. This distinction clarifies the subject-object of consciousness distinction, 
And imaginary is what comes from us. The imaginal is what comes to us. Now, the most urgent work of ensouled architecture is to help architects awaken to and engage this language and the imaginal realm, and thereby um, encourage a community of imaginers or imaginal uh, architects. The study of the imaginal realm or, the, or an intermediary imaginal approach to building design is not yet a discipline within the architectural curriculum. Ensouled architecture is one of the first attempts to introduce the study of the imaginal realm an intermediary approach to building design as a dis discipline within the architectural curriculum. Such an approach suggests there's a yoga in its broader sense to whole person architectural practice. Architects can train in the capacity to engage more fully with all the three levels of their psyche during the design process while applying this engagement's insights to more concrete principles of geometry, economy, and everyday architectural demands. Through this training, the personal soul activates and lends its support in creating integrally informed and soulful built spaces. In this way, ensouled architecture provides a new lens for considering the role of the architect as that of a yogi or shaman trained in the use of their whole person to help draw out and bring the soul of the built environment. A yogi in the spirit of Sri Aurobindo works to transform their personality and become an integral expression of themselves. Meanwhile, a shaman is a person who works with the spirit or the soul, shifting their state of awareness in order to communicate with the powers of the inner and outer landscapes. The role of an architectural shaman might involve reading and recognizing spatial potential. It might require listening in a manner currently uncommon to the architect's position, to the needs of the individuals, human and otherwise impulses and currents flowing through and interacting within the built space in question. By placing themselves first and foremost on the drawing board, the architectural shaman takes on the design process as a journey of a personal and collective transformation. Certain tools and techniques in this regard taken from Jung and Asagi Oli's model may be at the architect's disposal. Specifically, this study as an initial contribution to this presents certain psychosynthesis approaches and applies them to the design context. The purpose of ensouled architecture is to reveal a unique position where architects consciously design and create built spaces and engage the soul, individual as well as the cities, um, to broaden the feelings, thoughts, and imagination of the collective. Architectural metaphors seem to be a beneficial tool for achieving this purpose. Applying architectural metaphoric vocabulary to the design approach complements imaginal thinking and can be seen as a critical support for architects to think, conceptualize, organize problem solving, and innovate from non-traditional perspectives. In conclusion, um, this study has utilized transdisciplinary lenses from the fields of architecture, whole person psychology, and evolutionary consciousness studies. It has made two original contributions to the transdisciplinary field between architecture and psychology. First, by mapping Gebser's structures of evolution of consciousness with the history of architecture. And second, by correlating Asagioli's three intrapsychic layers to the three main categories of architecture developed in the study, the functional, radical, and the sacred. These contributions form the basis for the considerations of a new paradigm in architecture and soul architecture, which emphasizes an integral approach to wholeness and reimagines the fundamental purpose of architecture and the role of the architect. This research has benefited from my unique positioning as an architect, working deeply within the field of psychology. This uh, transdisciplinarity is allowed for a cross-pollination across fields and a comparison of relevant materials that uh, otherwise, otherwise might not have been possible. At the same time, it is important to recognize the study's limitations as a theoretical undertaking within the structures of academia. This project has been divorced from real-time application of its conceptions within the architectural workplace. Furthermore, it is important to recognize the beginning framework that this study outlines, especially with regards to ensouled architecture as just that, a beginning. 
questions of the client-architect relationship, economic considerations, the interaction of architects with contractors and urban planners, all have been set aside in order to properly initiate an integrated whole person approach, starting with and centered on the personal dimension. The role of the architect in mediating the essential relationship and struggle between the conscious outer or the existence of built spaces and the unconscious inner archetypal realms of the human psyche. But as the study has eliminated, architecture is intimately intertwined with and expressive of the evolution of humanity in uh, describing the current general movement in architecture and the urban environment towards fragmentation, uh, it becomes apparent that the presentation of integration and wholeness is crucial to moving this frag fragmentation to a new evolutionary phase. The consideration of a new phase in architecture, one informed by soulfulness and intelligence of the whole person can contribute to the restoration and emergence of the world soul. It is my hope that this study contributes to this movement as itself an evolutionary act and opens pathways for consideration that can carry into the future. Thank you. I also want to give a big thank you to Baman Debashish and Jessim for um, your support and ongoing encouragement in this um, process. And with this, I end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lakshmi. Um, there was so much material here. I just, I enjoyed so much because I never saw a presentation of your work, but you know, just read the material. Of course, there's so much more depth in the reading. So I'm sure when it comes out, it'll be a pleasure to read for many people, but, but to hear you talk about it is, is uh, just uh, also another experience. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. So we will uh, go ahead and, and, and ask the committee to comment, to ask questions from you, and uh, we'll spend some time on that. And then uh, the committee will convene outside of uh, the main platform here, and we'll get back to you. But first, our uh, external committee member, Professor Jaisim, could you please uh, ask any questions or uh, any, any comments that you might have, please? Lakshmi, Hi, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Baman Shirazi Ji. Thank you for this opportunity. And I love these huge, fascinating people on the board here. I look at, I'm going to keep it very short. I've read your paper of 900 pages, went through it months and months together, then went about it, then recollected my memories of Arabindo and Aravil and Chakrapani, who was one of the first architects when I was very young, walking through Aravil, meeting mother and then the rest of it, and meeting the other great architects who were working on this, which inspired me a lot. You brought back tremendous memories. I love the way you explained everything and you expressed everything for the simple reason. I love even the language of expression you used, not repeating unnecessarily anything. You seem to have mastered the way of expression. The only deliberation that I would like to have with you is something else deliberately an objective way of looking at it, of looking at it and saying, we are now in 2021, technology, religion, spirituality have all started fighting with each other or integrating with each other. I like the way when you said is the East, the chaos of the East and the order of the West. But I find the order in the chaos and the chaos in the order of the it was a very faint thing which I found when I was in Italy discussing with the architects. Then I point this can in the future, when especially when you're going to explore the maritime, I was yesterday talking to architects about the maritime architecture, going under the sea, going under the earth, and then going into space, where the spirituality takes you to different levels. The souls take you to different levels of expression. How can these expressions be made? Theoretically, yes. Physically, how? Or the philosophy of it, how can it be done? This also becomes part of your study. It will make a big sense if we can get the, because the past is there, the present is there. But the present becomes the past. As soon as you talk, you can't go back to it. I was trying to live with my granddaughters, the myth of reading through souls and witches and things. 
they are all very nice to read and listen in the cartoons and things, but it does affect. I like about the mythology of it and the psychology of it because if you push it very hard, I agree with the principle that architecture is all about human habitat and psychology, behavioral sciences, the built environment. Otherwise, it becomes pure engineering of just function, form, and expression. No, architecture is beyond this. And to put a soul on it, a timeless soul, I'm very happy to see these points. If we can get it physically, how to express it. You've shown some lovely expression, but for young architects, the education market, you brought education also into the picture of the future. How can it be pushed into them in a very uh, uh, universal way rather than just uh, the subcontinent or Europe or Africa or something and then pushing it up? It would be a tremendous thing. I really enjoyed your 40 minutes of lecture and the 900 pages of writing and writing and putting my young architects working with me. They enjoyed it more. They're quietly watching on the side. Don't do quite a lot watching. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure. Thank you, Bamanji. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Lakshmi, do you have any responses? Otherwise, we'll move on to uh, Devashish. Yeah, I, I think we can move on. Okay. So, Devashish, please go ahead. So, thank you, Lakshmi. Uh, yeah, I think uh, your, I, uh, your, your dissertation as well as your presentation is extremely stimulating because it opens up vast tracts of time and imagination and you really try to synthesize this and bring it to the front. Um, one of the questions that uh, comes to me has to do with, uh, uh, you know, looking at time and looking at evolution. Uh, we move through a phase, you showed the phase moving through the mental period into the modern period. And Gebser also sees that transition as a transition. I mean, we are still in that transition, moving from the mental structure to the integral structure. And the mental structure is characterized by individualism. And so even the examples that you showed of the people who are trying to build towards uh, an integral uh, sort of, I mean, transition, an organic transition, uh, are so very different from each other. Um, so my question has to do with how do you conceptualize the difference between fragmentation, which you talked about, and pluralism? Uh, that's a very good question. Thank you, Devashish. Um, I think the way I would look at it is, um, Yes, the transition period is where there are different kinds of architecture happening right now, as I showed the different architects who have different uh, theories of what is um, a conscious architecture. And it, it works very well individually. And when looked at just from uh, you know, that, that space, that, uh, that region, but when you look at it in a broad sense, it actually kind of is fragmented Again, so how do we bring that into a more holistic um, thinking is your question. And I think that uh, ties back to uh, what I was talking about in, uh, with regard to um, the transition. We're still in that transition period, trying to make adjustments to think in a more integral way. Like how, like we, we are changing uh, politi uh, in politics, in, um, in, in social relations, in, in every other um, field, there's a, like a transition. So I think the only way we can understand or we can um, uh, fathom something in the future of, of an integrated architecture is to just wait and see and to like start this dialogue among people, among different disciplines about this integral architecture or integral thinking, integral consciousness, where everyone's thinking where they align. And I think uh, that's, this is the start. This is where we start. We start talking about it. We start talking about it in um, groups, in uh, colleges, in uh, larger universities and conferences. And that's how you educate people. and brainstorm with people to like start thinking more on a similar page. 
Yeah, okay. Th thank you, Lakshmi. Yeah. I, I feel that uh, one of these uh, sort of, I mean, as you talked about communication and building uh, the ability to exchange, uh, and you talked about the imaginal, mm -hmm. uh, I feel uh, languages, imaginal languages of the imaginal forming communities of uh, language of that kind mm -hmm. uh, would be a stage towards that kind of uh, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think pluralism is bad. I think pluralism yeah. is not fragmentation, but yeah. pluralism can move towards the integral as it builds a language of the imaginal, I think, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I, I feel that your, uh, your, your ideas, your, your dissertation is opening up a direction of that kind. And that's what that's what uh, mm -hmm. one of the things that it stimulated in my uh, viewing of, of of your work. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Devashish. Thank you. Well, uh, look, is that it, uh, Devashish? Any any more questions or? For now, I think that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know, you know, I was thinking about what questions to ask you. Uh, and uh, it seems to me that uh, it's really hard for me to find only one or two things to talk about because there's so much really going on. Um, I should maybe start on a personal note. I got to know Lakshmi almost by coincidence because uh, we were at an East West gathering at one point and uh, they told me that somebody needs a ride back to San Francisco and it ended up being Lakshmi. And as we drove, uh, you know, the half an hour or whatever time it took, um, really um, got to know each other on some level, which was very interesting. And then uh, I don't know how you got to uh, talk to me about your project, Lakshmi, now, but I remember the earlier times when uh, there seemed to be nothing there. You know, you were talking about your personal experiences. You were talking about how to work with that. And, and I was just listening to you. I know almost nothing about architecture, you know? And um, so what was really interesting to me was not so much uh, commenting on your writing or your process in the beginning, but being with you and, and allowing your soul to come through, you know, as far as I could tell, you know, to actually express this, this project, you know, it seems rather easy now, uh, but this was not uh, articulated. Um, and of course, you know, talking about the imaginal as Debeshish was, was referring to, I think a lot of what you were talking to me in the beginning had to do with this. That's how we made the connections between various states of consciousness and and architecture you know and anyway at some point you know you started writing and and uh, then you come back and uh, all of a sudden you have these writings about the connection between history of architecture and and stages of consciousness <laughs> whether it was a Sajoli that you picked eventually or Gebser and so on so I just, I was impressed. I, I just, I thought that the whole thing was there in your soul and it just came out through this process. To me, that's so fascinating because I actually didn't know how many people would show up for a dissertation on, in, on architecture at CIIS, but it's, it's psychology of wholeness and architecture and it could be psychology of wholeness and just about any other field and or topic you know I think what's really important here is how we access the soul and how and that's what you did you access your soul and your knowledge and your reading and your mental capacities came in your imaginal capacities came in and I saw this process unfolding it was it was a pleasure and it was a pleasure to see you um, fulfill the whole dissertation and um, come to this point. But one thing that I remember we were talking about in the beginning, which we won't have time to talk about too much right now, but I'd like you to comment on it a little bit, is um, I remember that in the one of the first um, ideas about the dissertation had to do with, you know, I was interested in how does this work? How does this work to educate the future architect? How does this work to, uh, how, is, how is this gonna impact, you know, uh, 
the education of the future architect in, along the lines that you're talking about. And I think that uh, uh, I was even hoping that you would even come up with a chapter or two on actual concrete <laughs> steps, you know. Yeah. Um, but as Professor Jason has also mentioned, that's really the work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to say one thing before I ask you your opinion on this, is that I think whenever you work with a soul, it's going to be very difficult to try to impose preconceptions from the mind, you know, to say that the future of architecture is going to be like this, it's going to be like, it's going to be a unique process. And I think the bottom line of it for me has been to get the architect to connect with their whole self and then let whatever come up come out, you know, even the rules and regulations come out of that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you want to say a few minutes, because we do have some time now, you know, about what you see the future of your work possibly along the lines of education um, and your con contribution to architecture. I think you've made interesting contributions to study of consciousness and whole person psychology through this example. But probably the most important contribution will be in architecture. And I wonder if you, you know, see yourself down the road working along those lines and, and what, what can you say about that now? Because we dropped that part of the project, it was gonna to become too much, you know? Yeah. But what are your thoughts at this point about that? Shirozi, just one point here. Let me probably express that. In your theoretical thing, I'm just taking off from what Bauman said now. Can you, if you were not limited by the elements of the essence of the human thing, the five elements, the five senses, and the billions that join together, mm -hmm. if you want to express a human space, timeless, whatever it is, how would you do it? Would it be in sketches, three dimensional? Because I have long discussion before Jeffrey Baba died. We used to sit together over beers and beers and discuss it for long. I want to see how would you express this even in sketches of three-dimensional factors, limit, unlimited by elements and senses. How would one express this? Because that's the psychology that I see behind. What is the space and time of the human being now and forever? Mm -hmm. All right, so you're, let me get that question right. So you're asking me how would one express that in uh, either sketch or 3D or how would you express the ensouled architecture? Yes. Um, well, that's a very good point. I, I think how I would start as an architect would be sketching. To bring out whatever is happening in my mind, first I would meditate on it, first meditate and then bring it out on paper without having to um, have a, a computer. And I think that's, uh, I'm, I should say this, that I'm not a very, I prefer drawing, drawing more because it, it, it is connected. It, my hand works on the paper. So it's like all my thoughts are in, in my hand and it goes through and comes, shows in paper. And I think that's for me is more um, real that comes from within um, with regard to uh, bringing it, bringing it on, uh, expressing it. And uh, also it need not be in CAD drawings. It need not be in a blueprints. It need not be in um, the way that architects uh, are asked to um, show like li you know, licensing and like all the things that architects go through, but more organically. Why can't an architect have a set of uh, workers, the local workers and work with them on site a lot of architects actually do that. Um, I'm not sure how um, well they are, um, they're not very, it's not considered professional, but I find that more soulful where you don't necessarily need AutoCAD drawings or you know, detailed dimension and drawings, but you can build on site with natural materials. And I think that for me is more exciting and more soulful. Um, here, I'll just bring you one question of my experience. Yeah. The paper limits you to two dimensions. It doesn't let the mind, you see, but by the time the mind and the hand, the distance is too much. Mm -hmm. The hand is unable to express what the mind 
and the soul, when the soul is here, wherever it is in the mind. That distance coverage literally limits the architectural expression. Mm -hmm. How can this be done? Like we have a Ganesha, when we show Ganesha to somebody else, they look at it as an elephant, the fellow standing behind me and the other one behind. I look at it as the highest of abstractions when you see the Ganesha. What is he? Is he an elephant? Is he a human being? What is he? He sits on a rad and is writing when it's moving. It's beyond expression. And it's still an expression, right? Can that be resolved in the spiritual architecture which you are trying to? Whenever you use the word ensouled, that's what I looked at. When how can I ensoul the expression? Mm -hmm. It'd be really great if all the young architects get said, so this is a way of looking at something in a different mm -hmm. way. Can that be explained a little bit more, if you can? Like, you mean the imaginal uh, experience? Yes, imaginary. How imaginary. to, how to um, activate the imaginal realm? I think that's in what, way, yeah. yeah. Yes, in I way, think yes. um, the imaginal realm right now in architectural studies, I think it's not, it does not exist. It does not have like, you don't have a subject where you activate the imaginal. And um, I think the ways to activate the imaginal, uh, some of the techniques that I think I have mentioned are Jungian um, active imagination or um, Asagioli subpersonality um, theories where you, you separate out your, what is coming from you, but connect to the land and connect to what this land needs and act, like get into those aspects of um, active imagination than just, and also dreams, dream work and journaling. I think these could be a very good uh, ways of um, accessing the imaginal, like keeping a journal and regularly sitting in meditation with what comes and letting your dreams talk to you letting your dreams tell you where to move and which direction and which materials to use for this particular land. Lakshmi, if I may, uh, sure. related to this, um, yeah, it, 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 there's the whole element of participation mm -hmm. uh, because that, that again has to do with uh, individualism and the artist in the modern world. Mm -hmm. Where, uh, what is the relationship between the uh, between the architect and the project, right? Mm -hmm. Is it uh, an individual uh, relationship, or is there is it an immersive relationship, in, uh, a relationship of participation where somehow uh, the collective soul is manifesting through that uh, uh, to, to that architect? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, would you would you like to comment on that with regard to kind of finding an integral form? Yeah, I think uh, uh, what I would say is like uh, thinking of architect as a shaman, like he or she designs from a place where it's not their expression of uh, the design. It's not their expression of the psyche, but more they are channeling the, uh, the world soul through them. Like how can they separate their individual psyche from the collective psyche? Though they're both, they both related. The individual is the collective. Like, but, but accessing more deeper, going more deeper with the project than just sticking with, oh, this is my, this is how I feel. I want to like express my way of design. You know, you have signature architecture. You have each architect. This is the way they design. So it became, becomes signature architecture. So it's like more like the expression of that particular architect more than the expression of the collective. It just becomes their, uh, their signature. And I think, um, again, it comes back to imaginative studies and imaginal studies in architectural curriculum and trying um, to activate more, uh, to activate the soul in, um, in students and uh, architects themselves. Um, does that answer your uh, question? David? Yeah, sure. sure, sure. I, yeah. It was just a matter of uh, reflection, but ex exactly, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, we see examples, I mean, uh, I mean, high examples of people like, let's say, Le Corbusier, Corbusier mm -hmm. who came to Chandigarh and built a city 
at the invitation of Nehru uh, mm -hmm. at a certain point in time. But uh, did he immerse himself in the culture of the people? Or did he build out of a certain universal anthropology? You know, his whole yeah. idea was one of universal anthropology, but it's his universal anthropology. Exactly, yeah. Right? It yeah. isn't a, a kind of entry into the imaginal of the community. Exactly. So yeah. I, I think that there, when you're talking about uh, town planning or even dwellings uh, and the role of the architect, it, it, this plays into it in a very significant way because, uh, and you were talking about the shaman. So this actually gives the practical uh, content to the shaman's work because the shaman really embodies the community in that sense and gives voice uh, to the imagery, the symbolism and the functional, you know, the, even the psychosynthesis that goes on is a collective psychosynthesis. In that yeah, yeah. Yeah, Lakshmi, I think, you know, one of the things that um, uh, is implied here, we didn't really talk about it, but um, is the role of intuition, you know, I, mm -hmm. I think um, the, the difference, as you know, between imaginal and imagination is that Im imagination is a product of the brain, you know, it is something that is based on visualization and sensation. So here's you know, Professor Jaisam's question, how do you do imaginal without the use of the senses, you know, that means the brain and the senses. So I think, you know, if there are ways that can be developed, and I think yoga is exactly those ways. And what you're saying is that the, the, the architects should be trained to access their own intuitive capacities. The soul actually here means the message of the soul that comes about whatever it is that they're dealing with. And then at some point, I think the, the brain and the senses get involved because <laughs> if you want the imaginal to affect the, the, the physical world eventually, but, but to not to contaminate the imaginal with imagination and the yeah. imaginative is really important, I think, you know, and here's where the the, the practice of the yoga comes in. Uh, we did spend a lot of time, you know, with sacred architecture. You didn't really dwell on it in this in this lecture, but there are a lot of elements of sacred architecture that already exist. You know, we talked about the role of circular structures, for example, like if in a room, uh, in a classroom, let's say we started it as a uh, in educational institution building. We're talking about a building for CIIS. What would it look like? And we talked about around classrooms where everybody can see each other rather than a classroom where you see the backs of everybody else and only one person the you know professor or someone standing up front you know so just that role of the circle alone is one element uh, among many possible elements that, that has already been explored so i think you know in, anybody who who is adept in in sacred architecture will have the tools for it i think what is missing is the message of the soul you know and, and that message, not only in architecture, but I think even in, in, in the yoga itself, you know, I, I just started a, a practice with a group that I, that I communicated with recently about envisioning our own version, uh, you know, in time of a, of a more evolved version of ourselves, right? That's something that the soul knows. If I were to imagine, not who do I like to be, but, if I were to have an image in the, in, from the imaginal realm of what I would be if I'm more whole than what I'm right now, then everything else will follow from, from that. As long as that's the uncontaminated image, it's not coming from the head and all of that, you know. So, so I think, you know, putting that element of intuition and manifestation mm -hmm. uh, is also a very key element of, of your work. Yeah. Um, thank you, Baman. I think um, I do want to go back to your earlier question before I forget about that and before we move on to the next one. You asked me about how um, I would take this to the next stage, which where we earlier spoke about um, training architects and like our going and working with architects firsthand and like seeing, trying out this, this method with working architects and seeing how it works whether they 
whether it's successful in uh, addressing their or connecting them to their soul or um, the way I have initially, like what I would say is like when I have spoken very impromptu with architects, they're not very open to talking about the soul. They think it's too woo woo, it's too spiritual. You're just talking, uh, you know, you're talking ancient. That's the response I've got right now. But how would it be like what I would like to do is actually take that as a, as a project and go and work with architects and um, see how it works. And also probably with students, architectural students and developing a curriculum where you could train or activate, it, activate the imaginal or um, get techniques and uh, tools to understand what these subjects are and uh, introduce that in the curriculum. I think that would be the next step. Let me hear I have a point. Suddenly I remember writing to Spain and Peru, Anthony Gaudi, the great architect, was the greatest expression of this. He never knew what he would build. When I went two years back again, some people were trying to redo some of the works that were broken. I just smiled they said, who are you? So we are trying to redo some of the broke. I said, you can never knew because he never knew what he was going to do the next minute. That's the way he built those phenomenal forms of spirituality, of expression, which couldn't have been imagined in those days. Yeah. It's very difficult. He suddenly bring me back his images. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Uh, and Anthony Gaudi, uh, you know, when I was in school back then, deconstruction, uh, deconstructivism was, um, I was very attracted to that at some part of me in school. But when I visited Spain and I saw Gaudi, I was so fascinated. The interiors of um, the church, it just like took me to another realm. It was, it's just, yeah, it's magical how uh, he thought and how he can make that feel him, how he can make that um, experience for other people, for collective, it's beautiful, yeah. So uh, Lakshmi, I don't know, you know, if any of the uh, committee members have any more questions or comments, we'll leave room for that. And then we'll break out for about five to 10 minutes and mm -hmm. rejoin the group. Um, yeah. uh, Debushish, uh, Professor Jason, do you have any more questions at this point? If not, we'll reconvene separately. Sure, yeah, I no, no more questions. Okay. No. They're very exhaustive. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I think you, there there will be a way for the three of us to uh, convene in a, in a meeting room. Um, I think that uh, Stefan will be able to uh, tell us how that's done. I think it's pretty easy. So for just a few minutes, we'll leave the group and uh, Lakshmi will engage the audience and then we come back. Yep. Oh. Thank you. Yep. Lakshmi, congratulations. Thank what you. An Thank you. Outstanding, outstanding presentation. I mean, talk about insold architecture. The slides were just stunning. You say that you, you know, you fall at the at the feet of you know Gaudi's cathedral. I don't know where you got half of your slides from, but they were stunning, as was your presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's beautiful, beautiful work. Such Thank powerful, you. amazing, inspiring. I'm like, oh yeah, I want to see, I want to see the new paradigm. I want to see you teaching and leading the architects of the future. So Thank great, you. wonderful, bravo. Thank you, Ishtar. So nice to see you. You as well, you as well. <laughs> Watch me, that was brilliant. Thank you, Kimmy. It's so yeah. nice to see you. You made it. Investors are so proud of you. Thank you. Yes, I know. Your knowing comes from the land, comes from through them, through you, and what, what is unfolding, I believe, is, um, you know, it's just when uh, Alman was talking about when he first talked to you about it, and there was no form to it. And it was just, I mean, it was like, uh, this was dreaming, they were dreaming you and they dreamed you 
into this and into the, this expression. And I'm just, it's such a joy to see you. Such a joy to see you doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Kimmy. It's, I feel blessed that to just see you here. It feels very uh, nice to see you. It's beautiful. And hello to everyone else that some of you I know. Hi, Kimmy. Hi. <laughs> it's, it's Lily. <laughs> so hi Lily. Hi. Hi Ishtar. Hi Stefan. Hi everybody. Hi Ishtar. Good to see you. Lily, good to see you as well. Yeah. Hi, Ishtar. <laughs> Everyone. So nice to see so many lovely faces here. Where are you? Where are you? What are we seeing out your window there? This is uh, Maui. Oh, you're in Maui. What part of Maui? Uh, say that again. What part? We're in Maui. We are in Kula, upcountry Kula. Yeah, perfect. All right. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Yeah, it's beautiful here. It's beautiful. Yeah, I was so what? happy to get the invite. Thank, thank mm -hmm. Dave for getting that out. Lakshmi, I'm so proud of you. Hi, Mikey. So nice. Hi. So nice to see you. It was so wonderful uh, feeling you speak with such robust confidence and authority in your um, in your field. And I was picturing you speaking like at huge conferences to people because there's such warmth with which you speak, and it's such an important part of delivering of delivering something like this. It's complicated what you're delivering. It's it's really complex. So to be able to do that like with warmth. I could just see you very easily connecting with a whole auditorium full of people. Thanks, Mikey. That that feels very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Couldn't be prouder of you. Thank you. Mm. Hi, Martha. Hi. Hi, Lakshmi. I'm very happy for you. Thank you. I couldn't see the whole presentation, but it's recording, so I will see it, everything. Yes. Uh, but what I saw is really, really promising, and I'm really, really happy for you. Thank you, Martha. Thank you. <laughs> so nice to have you here. Thank you. Hi, Ishtar and everyone. <laughs> Good to see you, Ola, Martha. <laughs> Good to see you. Lakshmi, what's, what is the next step? I mean, they asked you the question of, you know, mm -hmm. teaching, guiding architects. What, what do you see besides resting probably and, being, <laughs> you know, with your baby? Um, yeah. What, um, I, I do have a couple of things uh, that I'm um, thinking about very seriously. One of the projects is definitely teaching. Um, second one would be to work with uh, different architects on a more um, um, city, uh, urban uh, architecture level where I can connect with different um, talented architects because I don't think I can design as well, but I can have a team who are very good at designing and we can um, you know, brainstorm on this. I think I'm very excited about that. I have a few names in mind. And one of the uh, architects that I showed, uh, Roth Azulik, who lives in Mexico, I'm very impressed by his work. So I want to like go and see if I can like work with him yeah. for, uh, for a bit and try and connect with different architects to see where this can uh, go. That would be very exciting. And I think this is uh, somewhat of an interesting uh, topic for um, a lot of architects, though a lot of architects think it's uh, not mental, so it's kind of confusing for them, but I'm excited to like bring this to them. I think it would be so cool to actually get them uh, to think that way. I think they would really, it would really benefit all of us. Yeah. Yeah. I had this idea while you were talking that maybe you could um, collaborate with Craig. There's something about mm -hmm. terror psychology and mm -hmm. installed architecture that they want to, you know, they want to, they want to be in communication. Yeah. Um, 
be lovely to see some collaboration with you and Craig. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Craig and I have spoken many times around a, a possible collaboration. We haven't spoken in the recent times, but we would talk at length about the possibility of doing something together. So that would be another opportunity and another um, place that I would, I, I would definitely consider that. I, would, I could probably write to him. Yeah. And um, another big project that I um, should mention is we're getting our house renovated. So that's a very exciting thing that I'm looking forward to in the coming days. Our home uh, and adding a few things and our garden space and building our um, veggies. And it's, it's very exciting. Wow, that's that's one of the next steps. Your house there in Maui? Yes. yes. Uh -huh. Well, one of the things, you know, that I find in working with students like you is it's not, um, it's helping them just find a way to walk the path themselves. I remember being up in Sami land trying to figure out my dissertation and I was walking on the tundra up there and I, I, was, I can't figure this out. I don't know how to do this. I know what I, I know what I want to have happen, but and I felt like the land, I heard from the land, it says, you can't think this, but you can walk there. Mm -hmm. So it's that, you know, walking one step at a time with the student, with myself, listening. Yeah, I mean, that's what I heard in what you were saying, just so much about accessing these parts of oneself that uh, from, and that's where the imaginal emerges. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. By the way, that's a beautiful presentation. You're just well done. Well done. Thank you. How old is your child, Lakshmi? He just turned one. One? Oh. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, he's a handful. Yes, I'm sure. One year old. Very mischievous and very, yeah. Very active child. Of course he is. He's your child and he's good. <laughs> what do you expect? <laughs> That's, That's wonderful. Hey, Lily. Hey, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. I'm so glad you could make it. Yeah, me too. Sorry, I didn't see the email a few days ago. You made it. My, nothing interesting ever comes to my email anymore, so I don't bother to check it. <laughs> okay, good to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was great. It was really neat to see the culmination of all of this, all of these threads you've been pulling together for so long mm -hmm. that we've talked about a little bit. And yeah, that was the the breadth and depth were way bigger than I uh, even imagined. So that was awesome. Thank you. Really cool. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> and it's just good to see your face and yeah. know that you still exist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lakshmi, I just wanted to get back in and, um, and uh, I don't mean to interrupt the, yeah. the conversation because we'll have some more time. Uh, at least 20 more minutes, but I wanted to uh, let you know that we have all enjoyed your uh, presentation and it's uh, absolutely acceptable and, and a great one. And as far as the, the dissertation itself, I think that uh, the normal finalization process will take place. And uh, so you're a, a new doctor, Dr. Lakshmi Maya, and uh, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> So we can continue the conversation for another 15 minutes. We still have time. Hi, Lakshmi. Hi, Sarah. I see you've sent me so many texts. Oh. <laughs> 
my That's mind was going. I was taking notes and making diagrams. And I love this so much because as I kind of summarized in there, I used to study architecture and engineering and did all of the CAD and all of that too, before I kind of was like, all right, let's do the liberal arts and see what happens with that. And luckily I've been able to, at least in my writing and with music and whatnot, bridge that back into how we view psychology and language and just, you know, mm -hmm. the, the evolution of consciousness in general. Um, and yeah, I made some notes there about some synchronicities that I found. Mm -hmm. And I think I just wanted to say like, thank you. This was amazing. It was really stimulating um, and exciting to hear all these parallels being drawn and, and the figures that you were working with, especially with Gepser. Um, and I loved the note that you said about, you know, how important it is to use our hands because yeah. I was the same way. I would go to my teacher and I'd be like, all right, I know the programs, like, let me sit at the table and do this physically with my hands. Like I want to do it from scratch. I want to be like physically involved in the process. And I think that's so important and it's a critical part of our evolution in general that we need to apply. And I'm sure that you really know that now as a mother too, like holding your child and watching him learn everything with his hands. Um, I did have a question. I'm curious how you would apply Gepser's idea of seeing through the world mm -hmm. to, um, to this kind of integral, I don't want to use the word holistic, but a, um, you know, ecologically sustainable and soul, um, filled like version of architecture if there's a parallel between his conception of seeing through the world or if there's like a juxtaposition there I just kind of see a resonance between that yeah I mean I think uh what I was the, the reason why I was doing the um the comparison or uh, the correlation of Gepser's five stages was because I saw that in uh, architecture that there is a parallel Right, and um, your 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 question is how would you see Gebser's uh, integral consciousness uh, in uh, architecture? Is that your question? To a sense, I mean, I can see it in like a biomorphic type of way, and we went mm -hmm. you went through a few slides of that, um, or just kind of you know this infinite creativity and imagination that we have within architecture itself that is very soul driven. Mm -hmm. It is very integral. It, it is connected to place and culture and everything. Um, but just kind of like that that phrase, you know, this this seeing through this this um, I guess it's fourth dimension, yeah. right, of consciousness. And I think maybe you already asked this, but not not just what the process would be, but what would that kind of look like if it, if we're to see it out in nature? Would it be something yeah. where it would be so? um like intimately interconnected with the natural environment that it would almost be like we're we're stepping through a door that we don't even know is there kind of right like it's very imaginal or would there be some kind of um way for us to differentiate that like those buildings that you were showing where you had the cathedral on one side and then you had like this post neo-modern uh building kind of coming in almost like a virus you know like connecting to it so I'm just curious what that would look like in a visual sense. Um, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure what that would look like. Um, uh, at this point, it's it's very difficult for me to like even think what it would look like. I have an idea in my imagination, but uh, to say what it would look like, it's it's pretty hard right now to to think about that. But um, I would say that for uh, integral transparent, transparent is what you're, you're saying, the transparency in uh, the uh, integral consciousness, the seeing through of all the structures in it. And that's what I hope to um, see, not just create something new or not just like the uh, image that you're talking about, not just have a deconstruction architecture next to a historical building, but how can we have all of those, but still feel more connected and not fragmented? And that I'm not sure how it looked like, but that's what I'm dreaming of. That's what I would like to visualize. Like, I don't know in, in form how it, it would look, but it's very exciting to think that there could be something that could have all of these elements. And it's not 
utopian or it's not like something dream like not um mm. just mimic something that comes to your imagination just as it is uh but more getting cues from the environment itself getting cues from other buildings too like not just forcing like you said like not like a wire is stuck to the building but more like how can i have a dialogue with other buildings too not mm. just other buildings but how can i have a dialogue the building itself having a dialogue with the people who are using this and not just in isolation having like an inside and outside having um courtyards having green spaces intersect like you know uh, yeah it this there's so much to it i'm not sure where to begin but it's i think jason would be uh, in a better um, place to answer that question lakshmi yeah i I, just, i thought it was a really good question and i thought you it was a really good answer mm -hmm. uh, that you just gave because like gebsard could didn't really have much to say about the rise of the integral mm -hmm. um he had lots to say about all the other mutations of consciousness but like what the integral is going to look like is something that that we're all feeling into which is mm -hmm. you're perfect for that i thought your whole dissertation was about that you 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 are the future of architecture that you're like sort of like reaching into that void to like pull out like what that is that's coming next mm -hmm. so i thought what you just said about it was spot on thank you jason do you have anything to add to that you have a long nice discussion you're doing very well research but now get into the abstraction of realization for the human being of the future but the with the touch of the past without repeating the past if you yeah. can do it is something phenomenal because architecture is finally a realized space that's the most it's not just art or technology but mm -hmm. human environment it, it, especially you brought in ecology and acoustics where you know we are i'm also part of ecology and acoustics department this is very important and that is the direction which you can you need not be the person to do it but you can give you can be the means for somebody else to express it and do it do it, 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 it to me it has been a great experience to be with all of you it's been unbelievable thank you very much for it thank you jason Are there any any questions? I see a lot of smiling faces. Uh, I wish we could have some tea and uh, a little time together like that. Um, if there are no other questions or comments, uh, I guess we can adjourn. Just making sure. We have just had breakfast here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're all in the middle of the night or something. <laughs> I'll ask a question. Hi, Don. Hi, Lexi. Uh, so my question is: the nature evolves, and the soul evolves. So how does the building evolve? Um, yeah, there you go. Because building, I, I mean, yeah, the building sometimes is very static, and everything around it changes. But how do you design for the evolution of the building? Well, I think. when you say how does the building evolve it is if you look if you think of the building as a being as well and how does the building evolve is like taking cues from the environment taking cues from the people seeing the changes that are happening in nature seeing the changes that are happening in climate seeing the changes that are happening in interactions and the people around and that's how you, you evolve that building you add and you just subtract um you take cues um i think that's 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 my answer and you Does can design for that you think that's something that can happen prior to construction or does that happen once the building is built or when does both. that both oh. i would say both Lakshmi, can you add one value to what he said? Sure. You take a building or a house, or I won't take a building. I've taken architecture, which you built for somebody thirty years back or twenty years back, and when the person comes back to you again after twenty years, the children have gone or they think it's a home. He says, "Sir, when you built it, there were about ten of us here. Now we are just two of us. 
but we still love the space. We still love it, but we are just two when we were 10. How does it evolve? I find that itself is an evolving architecture. You did say it in a very nice way. That is architecture. If, it, if the building cannot take that spirit, then it becomes engineering. It becomes mechanical. This is where architecture pushes it to a different level. The environment pushes it. That's the evolution process that happens. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Hi, sweetie. Just jumping on here from the same, the opposite side of the house from you in the garage where Sam and I are watching. And um, we're just tuning in with some just celebrations and congratulations. It was just awesome. It was this amazing presentation and you delivered it so well and so beautiful. We're sitting here in our uh, beach chairs in the garage and watching it on the iPad on a, a container. We have a box, all our boxes in the garage. So thank you so much uh, for just sharing all of this with us. It was very, very engaging. It was so amazing uh, here to see how engaged your committee members were with your material. I was very struck by that, just what a dynamic conversation was stimulated by your presentation. And I think that's very promising. Um, I think that's that's an exciting thing to um, to witness and, and feel into. And, and I think it's possible to imagine where, where things might go from there. So um, kudos and two thumbs up. All, your, all the production things worked out well. <laughs> and uh, thank you everyone for being here. And uh, shout out to um, uh, Padmini and uh, Maya in Bangalore. Just wanna say to welcome the two of you here onto the, the call and the presentation and say, thank you for being here. I know how much it means to Lakshmi um, and your support for throughout this process. Thank you, Gabe. That was my uh, part, my husband, uh, Gabe, uh, talking from the garage, who is um, who has been a big support in my life. And thank you, Gabe, for um, being there and watching this. And yes, I do want to say a big thank you to my parents who have helped me and been with me throughout this uh, dissertation process throughout i've grown so much personally through this process and um, i think my parents are like the biggest pillars and they have been so much to me thank you and i know that you both are very proud of this more than anyone else so thank you Well, Lakshmi, I hope I know you have a child to raise now, but uh, I hope that you can uh, keep on doing this. I just yeah. saw, you know, 10 different presentations in the one that you did today. Uh, it could be a class or two just on different aspects of this. I think people will see later when they have a chance to read your work that you've made a, a number of contributions, you know, in sold architecture being perhaps the least detailed of all, because it's just an idea that you're presenting, you know, just paving the way for the future of architecture. But you've done some sub substantial work in um, putting architecture and consciousness studies and whole person psychology together. Uh, I think that's, that's something that needs a lot of uh, uh, attention. Yeah, I think people can learn from, from the work that you've done in so many different ways. So I just want to thank everyone. I know that some of the old friends are, are here today and wish we had more time, but uh, we have to end this meeting. It was very pleasant for me. I thank the committee, um, especially Professor Jason and Devashish is ever present. Uh, so um, thank you Devashish for your work uh, and support. Uh, we'll look forward to finishing and, and I'll, I'll be in touch with you like to watch me pretty soon. All is well. Thank you Thank all. You. Thanks, Thank Stefan. You. Bye. Um, and I can just say for a moment. Um...